That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Earwig, the third film directed by Lucille Haji Halilovich, uh, which premiered at the 2021 Toronto International Film Festival in the Platform Competition sidebar, uh, as well as the San Sebastian Film Festival in 2021, where it won the special um, prize of the jury. It is being released uh, with little to no fanfare by Juno Films on July 15th, 2022, uh, where you'll most likely have to be in New York to see it. You've seen this movie twice. Mm -hmm. You read the book it's based on. It's based on a novella by Brian Catling. You love this movie. I really like it. I did not care for this thing. I, I know you did not. But not because it's... It's not a bad or poorly constructed film. I just didn't care for the story. I think it also will probably suffer from being categorized as like a horror film. Because what genre would you place it in? It... I think you almost, based on our very limited vocabulary in English, I think you'd have to call it a horror film. Uh, but it it really melds uh, horror with art house sensibilities that I that I miss from the '60s and '70s, like films by Elaine Renee and and David Lynch. I, I think you can really see her working with similar tropes in there. So I feel like if a person is selecting it from the horror section, they would be disappointed. However. Uh, uh, Haji Halilovich used to be uh, her ex-partner is Gaspar Noe and she I, I think she co-wrote Enter the Void and if you're familiar with her other two films you'll you'll see and if you like them what are her other two films uh, Innocence in 2004 with Marion Cotillard which all three of her movies deal with children being used in really weird and bizarre ways but Innocence is about a, a boarding school for girls where they show up in coffins and then are being groomed for reasons we don't know. Uh, and then in 2015's Evolution, it's uh, an island of women that only give birth to boys. And these young boys, uh, before they hit adolescence, take this trip to the local hospital and never really come back. And it's about one boy's eyes being open to them being kind of used to kind of be evolved in a certain way to be used by the women. Well, this movie is also about women who are being groomed for reasons we don't know. Okay, the basic story is, it's set like, you said post-World War II? Yep, I think it's post-World War II because the main Which would be like 50s. Yes, uh, the novel is set in Liege, uh, but Haji Halilovich doesn't make it, she's a little more ambiguous about, we don't know where it is set, somewhere in Europe. It feels like it's in a different time and space though, because even the styling is like, to me feels more 30s than 50s, but sure. whatever. It's about a man named Albert Albert played by Paul Hilton like this middle-aged man in this like house apartment and he's caring for a young girl named Mia who's like maybe nine or ten mm -hmm. and it's clear that this is not his daughter but he's caring for her and his main function <laughs> for her is this girl has no teeth in her mouth so he's making dentures out of her saliva so she has ice teeth mm-hmm that don't last long. That obviously don't last long. The minute he takes them out of the freezer, puts them in her mouth, they start melting. So then we see this... Oh, my God. I don't even have my notes. But I don't need them. It's just two notes. But you, we just see this girl drooling all the time. And then when it's time to replace her iced teeth, there's a contraption placed on her where it traps her saliva. Mm -hmm. like, like getting venom from a snake. And then he pours that into the mold, puts it in the freezer the routine starts again but he gets a call one day from some man saying i'm ready for this girl so you can bring her to me in 13 days and then we find out this girl has never been outside so part of him getting her ready is like she needs to get acclimated to leaving this apartment and child the first time this man takes his little girl outside she makes a break for it and tries to kill herself by like jumping in a body of water she tries to drown herself yeah okay so and notably that event is witnessed by a character named celeste a woman okay so then we see at a point oh boy uh is at a bar albert and this random man walks up to him asking him about his wife I'm not married. Well, what about your daughter? I don't have a daughter. The man's like interrogating him and it's uncomfortable. He knows things about his past. He knows he was an orphan. He knows he served in the war and things happened there. A fight ensues. Albert breaks the bottle like he's about to do something. And he goes to stab this man and he inadvertently stabs the bartender, which is a lady. Celeste, played by Romola Gray. Who's the woman who we see saw him with the girl. Mm -hmm. So he stabs her in the face and like maims her. 
Okay, so now there's another plot line of this woman, Celeste. There's some like little creepy man watching the incident happen, and he takes it upon himself to help her. Lawrence. Lawrence. So Lawrence takes Celeste to the hospital, and we find out this man, while she was like getting hemmed up, he had like STI checks done on her. Like we see the little sheet that says like she's negative for syphilis, chlamydia, gonorrhea, all the things. And he keeps her medicated with laudanum, which is highly addictive. So clearly he's trying to, he has intentions for her. Okay, so Albert takes the little girl to wherever the hell she's going, which appears to be maybe like a medical facility. It's important to know that he has flashbacks of like his wife who maybe died during childbirth. He has flashbacks of him as a child. He also sees like a portrait of like a mansion. Mm -hmm. So he drops off a little girl. We don't know why she's there. Oh, it is important to know right before the final step with this girl is she gets glass like dentures, mm -hmm. which are supposed to be like permanent. Don't know why. Okay, so the girl's dropped off. Albert is on the train back to wherever the hell he came from. Celeste and Lawrence are also on the train. He's the they are he still has the girl with him. At that point? Yes. Oh, so he didn't drop her off yet? No. Okay. Celeste recognizes Albert. Albert gets off the train because the train goes by a mansion that looks like, just like the mansion in the portrait he saw. And Celeste gets off and follows him. Probably to check his ass and also to get away from this creep Lawrence. Yeah, she escapes Lawrence. Mm -hmm. So they meet in front of this house and they have like a loving embrace. He sees the vision of his wife. He thinks the woman he's walking towards is his wife, but it's Celeste. They hug... And she stabs him in the face with like a broken piece of glass and proceeds to eat his face at the end. Mm -hmm. Okay, when you, you saw this in Berlin? No, I saw it... Uh, you saw it a while ago. Toronto. So when you told me about it, I'm like, oh, interesting. A girl with like ice teeth? What's up with that? No answers. Now, I've seen the film. Still no answers. So I think I kind of had an attitude because it didn't... I think you have to let go that there are no answers for that. It's not about why. It's about... Of course. I don't always need answers, but I think the film's very dry. It's very sparse. There's very little dialogue. M most of the sound we hear, which drove me crazy, is you hear this girl clacking her teeth and <laughs> slurping and mm -hmm. then like people... <laughs> but I would argue that it has a very uh, well done sound design because it is... If you like those sounds, it's well done. It's yes. not about liking those sounds. It's about the emotion or the reaction, the visceral reaction you have to listening to those sounds. Um, so, and I think that was very much on purpose by the sound designer Ken Yasumoto, who has worked with Gaspar Noe many times, including on Enter the Void, Vortex, and Climax. I think this is a case of someone who read a book and then saw the movie it's based on and they complement each other. So you're getting a little extra. We had a very long conversation about this earlier where you attacked me for being feeble minded. I'm not saying that I cannot analyze something and think about it and I don't need all the answers. I just think that if people are watching me talk about a movie and they say or they ask me, like, would you recommend it? I would probably say no, just because it's not going to give you probably what you're looking for. If you're looking for a horror film, this feels more like. I thought I. <laughs> if you like Eraserhead or Last Year at Marion Bad, then I think this is a film for you. Or if you liked her two previous films, uh, I like that. Romulan. I thought this movie could have been condensed to ninety seconds, and it could have been one of those shorts on Adult Swim in between the. I couldn't disagree more. <laughs> uh, I like that Romola Gray when when she is. Uh, brought to the hospital and she has that pouch on her face. She very much resembles the woman in the radiator from Eraserhead uh, for me at that point. But it, her scar ends up looking like an earwig and we haven't really talked about it all. Like that, that is um, Albert's nickname during the war. And then, you know, in an earwig, an earwig is this like gross, kind of innocuous, but has the ability to pinch insect, right? And he, he's marked, he, he's kind of touched all these He's marked all these women who he's come into contact with. And Hadji Halilovich adds uh, an extra dimension by suggesting that he had a wife and that may, there's, this, there's some ambiguity about whether or not Mia is his daughter because he keeps saying he's his keeper. In the novella, it's very clear that he despises this girl. He can't stand her even though he's spying on her. Um, I like the motifs of ice, uh, which requires a certain temperature for uh, the 
for ice to be made versus glass, which is made in, uh, you know, with a very different kind of temperature uh, and, and, a, and a kind of permanency. And I think that Mia is being trained uh, for whatever fetishistic reason to use these ice teeth for her eventual glass dentures. I think it's important to talk about the differences because, again, you're adding what you know from the novella to the movie. I'm, I'm really not. But, I, the, well, well, but you just did. So the differences are... Well, what did I add? that he doesn't that he's disgusted by her and that's in the novel in the movie that's more clear in the novel but i think that would help okay but can i go through the differences in the movie it's not clear that he is disgusted by the sound she makes it's just like he's caring for her and he's kind of forced to do it but in the book you're saying that it's very clear that he is disgusted by her then Okay. That's why I think the director is giving, giving us a different dimension by suggesting that maybe he's the daughter. And she dialed back the disgust a little bit, but it's clear that he doesn't love this girl. He doesn't have any kind of care or affection for this girl. Another thing that you glossed over was um, he keeps referring to the people that, the man that calls, which is uh, eventually that we learn is the same man that approached him in the bar, played by the Belgian actor Peter Van, Van Denbegin, who played Nicholas III in King of the Belgians. Um, he, it's clear that these retainers, she's growing. She's, she's evolving into something that they need at a certain, whoever needs at a certain stage. And the retainers don't fit and are causing her to pain and to be bloody. And there's a cleaning lady in the book. It's a small boy, but there's a cleaning lady just outside. And he just kind of opens the door and says like, Hey, can you uh, contact the masters? Cause I don't have any way to get them. And that's when somebody shows up, uh, to put her, uh, glass dentitia in, uh, as well as brings this black cat that uh, bonds immediately to the girl. And he tries to kill it in the film. It just scrap claws the hell out of him. But in the novella, there's this supernatural element because he, he literally strangles the cat and it cannot die. Uh, but the cat, it, the talk with the black cat who resembles to me like behemoth from master and the margarita and the talk of the masters. I think that is a, a supernatural element as well. Okay. So it's clear that you're irritated and don't like this film, but I, I said that I'm irritated. It's just that I think like, first I said, I want to describe the differences and you go on a rant. Like the, I'm, I'm trying to explain, you gotta get it out. Well, what I'm trying to explain is that I think the first like 30 minutes of the film is really dry. Like there, there, there's no, like, it's okay to pose this ridiculous scenario of a girl with ice teeth. Like what's the point of her having ice teeth? She can just gum it. So then it's like, okay, we're never going to find out why, but then there, there, there's no understanding of like, you said in the book there's there's a greater sense of dread. We understand that she's uncomfortable because the retainers sure. don't fit. In the movie, we don't get that. We just see her like matter of factly like sitting in one spot and kind of eating her food. Like it, like it's not a big deal. So I think that threw me off a little bit. Combined with this supernatural element about the cat in the movie, there's a, a kind of a disturbing scene where he tries to kill this cat because the cat's being annoying. And as he's strangling it, the cat attacks him and he lets it go. You're saying in the book, he breaks the cat's neck and the cat doesn't die. It's like, more, it's clear. Like it's pet cemetery the, shit. Yeah. Like so the, the cat won't die. All I'm saying is that I think the symbolism is there. We could go on and on about it. I don't disagree with that. I just think the way it's constructed in the film, it's very sparse and there's a lot of dead space where I feel like if those details would have been added, I think it would have given me a little bit more. But as it is, I'm just forced to kind of like connect these dots. And it's like, okay, so what's the overall message I'm getting from the film? It's a story about how women like don't have agency, like how, like how culture has, our culture has made it historically, like women don't have agency, like their, their well, bodies are being used in ways that they're not condoning from the youngest of age to this grown ass lady who's independent. She works. And then somehow she finds herself in a situation where this man has insidious intentions for her. So I think it makes sense. Yeah. And, and how he refers to himself as, as the keeper. And then this, this, um, connection to the, the earwig is just these, these vague predatory creatures in this court, sort of natural hierarchy that's going on because every woman that he comes in contact with, he touches, even he hurts, he maims, even though he really maybe he wasn't trying to, he didn't try to kill his wife in childbirth. He's not, uh, he's not the one that is in charge of, you know, hurting this girl that might be his daughter. He didn't mean to maim the waitress. And I, I find that really interesting from that perspective i uh, think it could be interesting i guess i'm just confused because yes like how men sort of control women and how even when they're not trying they control them 
because of how our culture is set up. So yes, how he's oblivious to his role in that. And, right. And yeah. I, so that does make sense. I like that there's a sense of fate because the. Uh, Hadjitha Lilovich also gives us flashbacks to his childhood, which aren't in the novella. And that there's this stuff of, uh, having to do with glass, which may be a woman with his, that might be his mother is, you know, making the sound at the top of the glass. And uh, he has a display of glassware that he's, that we think he thinks is beautiful. And Mia breaks one and he very carefully wraps it up uh, to do like what glass way. has it seems like it has special meaning to him but mm -hmm. then it's like okay but then he wasn't in charge of this girl getting glass teeth so then i'm like ostensibly what is, we don't we don't we don't know but it's just so like okay i don't need the i mean i'm not a simpleton i don't need things sort of perfectly packaged in an entertaining loud funny way i can get into stuff that makes me feel something this movie just didn't send me anywhere like i'm just watching this girl with drooling and gagging and clicking and it's just like okay kind of like how i felt about eraser head like this gross little ass baby it's like but at least eraser head i feel like had sure eraser it was a little more far off the ledge and I, I i can get more on board with that movie mm -hmm. this one i think is well done it's based on something so it's not like this person wrote the story they just interpreted it so it's well done the acting's fine i mean there's not any talking really so it's just yeah people... there's very little dialogue which i find interesting i will agree it, it is pretty static you i think you should be in the mood the mood and i wasn't in the mood so i'm not shitting on the movie because it's bad i wasn't in the mood i thought it was going to be something a little more midnighty horrific and it really isn't it I, that said, I do really like the look. It has this this European vibe of menace of a certain you know mid century menace. Uh, it was shot by Jonathan uh, Riquebour, who I really like his work on Albert Serres' The Death of Louis the uh, Fourteenth. Again, I like the look of it. The score uh, I also reminded me kind of of Alexander Aja's High Tension, um, but the score had uh, three people composing: Nicholas Becker, Augustin Viard, and Warren Ellis of Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds. What else you got? Uh, th that's about it. Her usual co-scribe, Jeff Cox, uh, adapted the script by uh, uh, Brian Catling, who's known is a sculptor slash author, and he's known for this sci-fi fantasy series called the Vor Trilogy that apparently is highly celebrated in the UK that I have not read. Um, again, I, I think that he gave this... Hadji Halilovich herself was kind of groomed to direct this before the book was even published because uh, you know, I, I pay attention to what she does, and uh, so I knew... Well, I do. She's a filmmaker oh, I really that's like. That's great. Um, which maybe means I'm potentially biased. But I do agree that it, it is very static and it is very... Um, <sighs> of a certain mood and vibe that feels one note. But even after watching it a second time, like I'm excited thinking about the implications of what's going on. And I, I love this like dark painting with the fire going on in the background that really is very last year at Marion Batty that they end up on the the lawn and from a perspective look like lovers embracing when really she's devouring the side of his face so it's all a matter of perspective um so yeah no, I don't know I, I I think the book would have been interesting or maybe if, you know yeah I mean it's I don't think it's bad what it's would you okay. give this movie three and a half I would give it two out of five because I didn't enjoy it, but I, but I would recommend it if you're in that mood for things like that. Sure. But it's not a horror film that's going to make you jump. In. I would agree. I don't think it should be classified as horror. I think it's just a, an art house menace. It's a menace. Uh, what else? That's it. Hit the thanks button. Listen to our podcast. Bye. <laughs> Bye.